within my heart is a melody that was not taught in the darkest night it still goes on the anthem of my god within my heart is a treasure that cannot be bought when all else is faded it will not the presence of my god oh magnify the lord let us exalt his name together no one beside you Lord honor and praise are yours forever before your throne in the mystery that can be known there's the majesty that's yours alone. How glorious you are, you are the one who redeems the wrongs that I have done. Reigning over all the days to come, how glorious you are. His name together, no one beside you, Lord. Honor and praise are yours forever. Honor and praise are yours forever. Thank you for that song. It was a lovely song to, to center my heart to worship the Lord. Thank you. Good morning to everyone here at New Life, in person or online. We're glad you're here with us on the Lord's Day. And, uh, and as typical, before we begin our worship, we have a few announcements and 
Just some logistics to run by you so you know what's going on in our church community. And first off, um, even though, as you know, things are different, but uh, the Lord calls us to support the work, the mission, and the vision of the church. And uh, you can drop off your gifts and tithes in boxes that are out there in the foyer, or you can give online, which is a, just a great way to do it. And we also want to know how you're doing, and particularly if you've got any prayer needs. So there are prayer cards out there that you can drop also in a box. I think it's labeled prayer. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, those cards will go to Mark Moser. And you can also email Mark at mmoser at newlifeglenside.com uh, with your requests. But I'm going to take it just a step further here. We're called to be the body of Christ. And as the body of Christ, we are, we are called to be, we are, we are connected to one another deeply, and we share our lives together. So let me encourage you that you should share your life, share your struggles, share your heart with one another, and, and reach out to those that you know when your heart is in need of prayer. I am struck by Paul in 2 Corinthians during a time of great stress where he said, this is the great apostle Paul, you helped me with your prayers and, and I am helped when people pray for me. So we can do that within the body of Christ as well, okay? Four events coming up and that's the first one on your screen there. We have another church-wide art project um, for Holy Week. We had a great art project during Advent, and uh, what was designed by both kids and adults was simply beautiful. So our artist in residence and children's ministry director, Amy Lewis, has some blank canvases downstairs in some bins. So on your way out, grab some of those canvases and take them home. Um, and, and again, we're gonna do what we did last time, when you bring them back, we're going to post them on our, we're going to hang them on our walls, and then we're going to put together a video and show them online. And, and again, what was done last Advent was simply beautiful. Remember, you can draw, like with a pencil. You can paint with, well, paint. You, you can use all sorts of medium, and, and again, here's your opportunity to, to learn again that, that word we had to learn last Christmas, Decoupage, remember we had to look that up? That's when you've got, you can throw all sorts of material on a blank canvas and throw it together and make it look good. So fire up your creative muse, grab a canvas, and, uh, and create to the glory of the Lord. Next week, next slide. Oop. All right, next week is... Communion Sunday. So I just want to say it's available in person uh, during the service, and it's available afterward uh, by driving up in the parking lot between 12.15 and 12.45 p.m. Let me, let me encourage you again that if you have been missing communion because you're not able to come into the church, let me just say that drive-in communion in your car I know it doesn't sound appealing, but it's really lovely, and I've grown to love it because you can be served communion personally, and, and you've got time for prayer with the elder who's serving you communion, and it's communion. And remember all of what the elements of the Lord's Supper is about. So don't hesitate to drive up if you're at home, and we would gladly serve you communion. Um, next thing, we're entering Holy Week in a few weeks, and um, let me just run through what we've got. Thursday, April 1, is our traditional Monday Thursday service where we have communion that's normally done in a different way. I just want to say we're thinking about how to keep that tradition alive while maintaining safety in the building. So we haven't worked out all the bugs yet. But we think in order to do that, we may have to ask for you to sign up in advance if you want to come in. So pay attention, look for your emails, uh, the New Life E-News, 
and we'll give you all those particular details. Good Friday service is uh, on the next night at April 2nd at 7.30 p.m. Both Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday are both online and in person. Then Hudson and Brianna, behind me, are gonna lead a brief Easter morning sunrise service at, wait for it, 6.30 a.m. out in the parking lot. Bring a chair, bring a coat, <laughs> bring a blanket, uh, bring your masks. Uh, you can stand, it's gonna be relatively short. It's gonna be a lovely time of song and, and scripture reading to start what is one of the most, what is the most magnificent day in the church calendar. And then a few hours later, we're going to have um, our Easter Sunday service here and, on, on, and online. One more thing, we are working to put together a concentrated time of prayer for the church community between Monday, Thursday, and Easter Sunday, where we want people to sign up through all the hours of those days to pick a time for prayer. And we think this is a contemplative way that can focus our mind on really what the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ calls us transforms us and sends us out into the world. And prayer is the way we do that. So look for details about that as well. Lastly, save the date. Sunday, April 25th, after church from 1 to 5 p.m., another church picnic. Were you here last fall when we had the church picnic? It was a blast. It felt so incredibly good after months of isolation to be outdoors with a bunch of people doing things. And we're gonna do it again. And our picnic maestro, Henry Hoff, who is right here, <laughs> um, is again leading the way. And you see a picture of a kite there. He's gonna somehow lead us into flying kites on the big open field. Um, so pray for sun, pray for warmth, uh, and wind. Pray for wind. <laughs> but not too much wind. Um, so anyway, put that on your calendar. It's going to be a great day. And, and if you've got any ideas about outdoor spring things to do, contact Nancy Bauer at nbauer at newlifeglenside.com. Uh, this is just going to be a great, I want this to be a great spring and summer when we exit this pandemic and we can begin to spend some time together with brothers and sisters. All right, thank you. Well, good morning. You know, typically right here at this point in the service, we like to do one of two things if possible, and that is a ministry update. Maybe our deacons, for instance, that area of ministry, or a testimony. And one thing I've learned to appreciate is that I used to think testimonies were only testimonies of conversion. You know, how did you come to faith, which are great testimonies. But there's a whole bunch of other ones, and I, a lot of them fit into this category that I love, which I call uh, a breakthrough testimony. Breakthrough. We're going to hear one at, near the end of my sermon, not now, and it's going to be video. But when I say breakthrough, you know how it's so easy for us in a long Christian life to get stuck at times or maybe worse than stuck, and then there's a breakthrough. And we're going to hear a testimony like that near the end of the sermon on video. But I, I want to put a shout out here for anyone who has a testimony like that. Please let us know. We'd love to, to talk. We want to hear it. And maybe this is the place to share it too, because uh, this is really encouraging to us, is it not, when we hear of the Lord at work in our, in our, in our lives today breakthrough moments. Uh, so for right now, I just want to jump right into the call of worship. Uh, this is from Isaiah, or if you're from other English-speaking parts of the world, Isaiah, which sounds cooler, I think. This is from Isaiah 61. Will you please rise 
to hear these three verses that call us into a corporate worship right now together of the Lord. Isaiah 61, 10 and 62, 3 and 5. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in the God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Let us worship. So we want to share a new song with you. This is a song that we did about a month ago here. Um, Ooh. One moment, one moment. We don't want to be in that key. So um, so this is a song we did about a month ago. Um, So it'll be uh, new to a lot of you, and you are totally welcome to sing the responses. It's a call and response song for the most of it. So feel free to just sing the responses in the beginning um, as you get comfortable with it. And then um, as you go along, feel free to sing the call and the response. Um, But in either case, um, consider these words. Consider the questions. um, Contemplate as you're answering them what they mean for you. Do you feel the world is broken? Please do. And do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Oh, it is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah. Father. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. And does our God intend to dwell again? the 
pray for us here, but um, I don't know about you, but there's been um, a lot about the last months that have not been easy, and even in the last week, um, I see kind of trends in myself, depending on where I'm at, um, toward contentment and longing, but also doubt or, or shame creeping in. Um, so I wrote this prayer um, to center myself in those moments, and it has kind of four movements, four short movements to it. Um, so it's in first person, but I'm I'm hoping that it'll be, um, you can identify with it and contemplate um, and pray with me on it. So um, I want you to envision yourself with your hands outstretched. If that means that your hands are actually outstretched, that is, that is up to you. But you can imagine um, your hands open and I'll leave just a few brief silences between some sections for you to, to contemplate and pray yourself. So will you um, pray the words that are going to be up on the screen just to start with us here? We're going to pray these together. So when they're up there, all right, let's, let's pray this, this together, and then I'll pray for us. We have not known thee as we ought, nor learned thy wisdom, grace, and power. The things of earth have filled our thought and trifles of the passing hour. Lord, give us light, thy truth to see, and make us wise in knowing thee. We have not loved thee as we ought, nor cared that we are loved by thee. Thy presence we have coldly sought and feebly longed thy face to see. Lord, give a pure and loving heart to feel and own the love thou art. And let me pray for us. So I honor you, Lord. The treasures of our God remain. We come to you with nothing in our hands. As the psalmist says, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. And Father, we are yours. Search me, Lord. Maybe sin's hangover of guilt, shame, doubt lingers in us, or maybe, maybe not. Maybe we're unaware or hiding, burying our failures, the wrongs we've done to you. Search us, Lord. Purify me, Lord. We have a sacrificial lamb who paid our debt, who stood in our place when it should have been us. 
quiet lies we or others speak to ourselves and make loud your truth. Because what is most true, most real, most foundational is that I am a beloved child of the Father, a co-heir with Jesus Christ, sanctified, justified in Christ Jesus, not condemned. So purify me, Lord. I honor you, Lord. When my language fails to express my deepest gratitude or my head and heart are out of alignment, let me sing poems, songs of praise to you. Take my living every day and make it a joyful noise that others may join to your glory. Amen. You may have a seat. morning. I love that song. It's hard not to break up in the middle of it for me. (laughs) Thank you guys. Let's pray together. Continue praying together. Our Father in heaven, we have not loved you as we ought. Jesus, Lion of Judah, you are worthy of all blessing, honor, and glory. So we say, come Holy Spirit and sanctify us this day. Give us pure and loving hearts to love you as we ought and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So we ask that you bless our church community, our pastors, our elders, deacons and deaconesses, our church staff, our ministry leaders. Give us all wisdom, love and a zeal for your kingdom. Teach us how to care for and love others well. Bless our food cupboard, our meals ministry, our community groups, our times when we get together for worship and fellowship. May others know by our love that we are followers and disciples of our King Jesus. We pray that you would protect and where needed restore our marriages, our relationships with our children, youth, and our members who are aging or suffering. So many of us have experienced long periods of loneliness through this pandemic. Father, would you comfort us, would you comfort them and renew their hope and joy in you and in your kingdom promises? May we be a community that reaches out to the lonely and to one another. We thank you for the church planting work that has been going on in London these years with Bob and Karen Heppy and with the grandmother of our church, Rosemary Miller. Bless their community as well as our own as the coronavirus interrupts their lives and ministry and give Rosemary faith and energy to complete her mission for the kingdom. And we pray for the vaccines, Lord, that they would be well and quickly distributed and that you, Father, would turn back this awful disease. We continue to lift up those who are weak and vulnerable, asking your protection. And we pray for those in our congregation who are undergoing cancer treatment, for Chris, for Dave, for Nadine. And we grieve with those mourning the loss of loved ones and ask for your comfort, for Iveta, for Azor, and for Doug. Would you be their strength and their shield, we pray. Lord, please watch over and protect those from our congregation who are currently serving in the military. We pray for Jess and for John, Tom, Shane, Luke, Lee, Emma, and Ben. We thank you for their desire to serve and protect our nation. So we ask that you would protect them as well. And finally, Father God, we we ask that you speak to us through your word and give Pastor Mark guidance by your spirit as he teaches us what you would have us receive and to your glory. It's in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. It is great to see so many of you here, and again, welcome to those of you online. 
This is actually the end of this uh, short sermon series entitled Proverbs for Children. Children like us, you might be an adult like me, and this is kind of an adult topic today. But first of all, what is, what is wisdom? Proverbs is supposed to be about wisdom. Let me show you a picture. It's actually three pictures I want to show you to, to start you off here with. Hopefully it will come up here. There we go. I hope you can read it. First is data. A bunch of empty circles. This is like a bunch of ones and zeros in a computer file. Who knows what they mean? Well, if you know what they mean, if you can interpret the ones and zeros, the data, you're on to information. And now they have a little color here. And who knows, maybe this information is a list of all the laws in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Information. And now we want to get it in our head, in our mind, and it becomes knowledge. And I like that picture where now they're showing you the way we store information in our mind is there's relationships between the data. There's an organization to it. There's, for instance, there's misdemeanors and felonies when it comes to Pennsylvania laws. There's other categorization. There's other things that are similar and different in our mind structures. These things as knowledge. But we're not on to wisdom yet. Two more pictures. I like the next one the most. Insight. Now there's a couple, looks like yellow light bulbs <laughs> going off. A cup out of everything you know, there's a couple of maybe these laws, if you're a lawyer, if this is Pennsylvania Commonwealth law, or maybe a couple judicial decisions, or a couple things that are important and you know it for this case and you have insight that these are two really important things. So out of all your knowledge, insight selects some of it particularly relevant. And then finally, wisdom. Now you're practically, we're really practically thinking of how can we connect, uh, I think you saw the next slide, didn't you? <laughs> how can we connect practically what these two facts or whatever, how do we connect them? How do we persuade a jury? How do we persuade uh, uh, you know, th that our client is, is innocent? Practical life. And then finally, yeah, this is, it's, this is <laughs> it's supposed to be a, a little bit of a, a funny thing. The Jewish star of David here, which is satirizing appropriately conspiracy theories against our Jewish neighbors, which they are the targets many times of, unfairly, of course. So this is just a little funny thing. But I, nonetheless, even though it's kind of a comic strip, I love the first five things there that shows wisdom. Now, the title of this sermon is uh, The Sex Ed You Won't Get in School. The Sex Education You Won't Get in School. And we're looking at Proverbs for the last time, Proverbs 1 through 9. And boy, does it talk a lot, chapter after chapter, about this theme. But what do I mean by uh, what you won't get in school? I'll tell you what I don't mean today. What I don't mean is I'm not going to be really looking at what the secular world or uh, major American culture teaches or thinks about sex, its value system, how it's changing, or what's actually taught with regards to values in the public school system, not our political challenges or legal challenges or any of that. We're going to leave that aside, even though I think it's important. Instead, what I mean by what you're not taught in sex ed classes, what I remember learning from, in health class, they called it, and I, and I learned it from a man we all called Coach. And uh, it was kind of information, at the information level, right, that we just saw here. 
on this life. And we're going to hear in Proverbs from, again, the wise dad, the wise father. And he's not exactly covering the birds and bees with his son. <laughs> kind of assumes he knows that, but moving on with that knowledge towards practical wisdom of how to live this world in this world in that area. So let's just jump right into this and see how this father sounds different than what we might have learned in health class or sex ed class. Turn to Proverbs 5. All right, we're going to read two passages today. This is the first one. Proverbs 5, and we're going to start at verse 15 and go through the end of the chapter. I'm going to read the whole passage together. This is the word of our Lord and God. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight and be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for a lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. Verse 15, I start off with a strange phrase. Drink water from your own cistern, your own well, which pretty much means drink milk from your own fridge. But what does that mean? And in this context, it means have intimate relations only with your spouse. Don't commit adultery. Don't cheat. That's what it's saying. That might sound just like the seventh commandment. If you know the Ten Commandments, don't commit adultery. And it really is exactly saying that. But I want you to note something I love about how God says things in Scripture so many different ways. And this one isn't just Mount Sinai written on tablets of stone. Do not commit adultery with, with God's authority. This is... This is a dad earnestly appealing to his son, sincerely entreating him, my son, my son, don't do this. It's different than what you had in health class, but just the information about sex ed. And it's even different than the law of God at Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, same content. But the form is different, the appeal of a dad who's seen things. I remember growing up in the 1980s and hearing a lot about drugs. Don't do drugs. Just say no. Good messages, right? And you might get to the point where you're in high school, I don't know, or early teenager, and you might think, boy, I've heard this all the time from adults. Sometimes it's the law enforcement, sometimes it's teachers or my parents. It's, it's these adults who keep telling me it's bad, it's bad, don't do it. And by the time you're a teenager, you might start to chafe against that. Wonder if these adults are conspiring just to take away your fun. And then you hear something different. A mom at the microphone with tears in her eyes. 
her husband next to her. And you see a picture of their son in his football uniform. And he was lost. He's dead due to drugs. And you hear this presentation, and at the end, the dad says pretty much these words. Don't do drugs. But now it sounds so different. It's not just from a th- an authority. You can feel the appeal, the sincerity of, I don't want you to go through this. My pain, my heartache, I've seen things. Please listen to me. And that's what Proverbs is like. Verses 18 through 20 I read, if you want to peek at those again. I think they're PG still. But there's some physical description there. A little bit of sensuality is hinted at. When I was doing youth ministry, I used to like to have high school students read this passage out loud, partly to embarrass them a little bit. But it makes an important point if you haven't read the Bible. There's passages like this, and it makes you ask the question, who invented sex? Was it God or the devil? And if it's the devil, this doesn't make sense. And we can understand why the topic can be sullied, dirtied, ruined. And we need to remind ourselves this is something God created. God created all kinds of things, right? And they're not all mentioned in Genesis 1 and 2. Only a few things are, and this is one of them, basically. What a gift, what a good gift with the intimacy that allows between a man and woman whose bodies are built for this and and not just intimacy, but they can create a new human being sometime. That's amazing. And the pleasure, this is one of God's most important gifts that it is basically there in Genesis 1 and 2. It's created by God, not the devil. This says something about the character of God. Just think through those things. The intimacy, the ability to procreate, and the pleasure involved. This is what God wanted to give to humanity. I know you might be sitting there thinking, that hasn't been my story. And this is widespread. Whether you're single and maybe the story has been waiting that you didn't choose, matters how you see your singleness, whether you want to get married or not, or whether you're married. There's just all kinds. I know this, this disappointment, pain, sometimes actual victimization. There's being a victim. All kinds of things. And it's a, it's a hard subject. And what you might say is, I'm not living in Genesis 1 and 2, the goodness of creation. I'm living in Genesis 3 on this one, Moser. You know, the, the fall, the entrance of evil. And so your comfort might be in the rest of Genesis, or at least people who you could relate to, like Leah and Dinah. And even Joseph, people who know pain in this area, it's a tough subject. But you know what, even the pain is there and the suffering, do you you know it's actually because sex is such an important, great thing that God created? Because it's so great, because it's so awesome, that is exactly what makes it so dangerous to pervert and so painful and source of so much suffering because it's so great? I mean, just think like, for instance, 
as an analogy, you know, the parable of the prodigal son. You know, when the dad gives this amazing gift of half of everything I own, that's amazing. What an amazing gift. But that's what enabled the son in one sense. I'm not blaming the dad. But that is really what enabled the son to go do horrible things he wasn't able to do before. Because he had so many resources and the gift was so great. And that's what this topic is. The greatness of it, but also then, when it goes awry, so much pain. This passage is focusing on some of what goes awry, and specifically adultery. Let's just turn to my second passage. Just flip a page. Maybe you don't have to do that. It's in chapter 7. And it continues this theme. I'm going to start at verse 1. We'll read this whole chapter. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call insight your intimate friend. To keep you from the forbidden woman. From the adulteress with her smooth words. Let me stop there. The forbidden woman, what does that mean? This is not saying that all women are forbidden or some kind of evil temptress uh, for all women or something. Of course, it doesn't mean that. The forbidden woman is the is the one you're not married to. The forbidden man, the one you're not married to. And notice what the, the wisdom is saying. The first four verses I read, I just read the first four verses are stay close to wisdom, treasure wisdom, you'll have life. And then here's the first application of that, verse five. Stay away from the adulterous woman. That's wisdom. That, the New Testament will put it this way. Flee sexual immorality. Flee it. Somebody had to remind me this week of Angelo Giuliani up here getting all animated on that. Flee. The house. If your house is on fire, what are you going to do? Sit down and pack your suitcase? Turn on the TV for a while? Take in a show? Get out of there. The house is on fire. Don't even be near the house if you know it's on fire. Flee. Stay far away from her. That's a different kind of wisdom. And the wisdom that, that we might think says, how do I do it and get away with it? Right? We sometimes call that, how, how do I commit adultery and get away with it? Now that's wisdom. That's what we call worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom. What this is saying here is staying away from sexual immorality, temptation. That is True wisdom, or sometimes we say godly wisdom or biblical wisdom. That's what we're talking about here. Well, let's keep reading, and now here comes a story. This dad has seen a lot, and I think what we're going to read is probably a composite story of things he's seen. For at the window of my house, verse 6, I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense. Passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. In other words, Under the cover of darkness, here goes a young man to a place he shouldn't go. And what happens next? Verse 10, and behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward 
Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner, she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face, she says to him, and now listen to what she says in the next few verses. I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. Now that's the first thing she says, did you catch that? I have offered sacrifices, paid my vows. Let me put that into modern parlance for us. I just came from church. Sorry, I just came back from Bible study. Choir practice. And I came out to meet you. This is one of the most confusing things when it comes to temptation. You know what the devil doesn't do? The devil doesn't say, hi, I'm the devil. I'm evil. You can't trust me. I want to ruin your life. But right now, I'd like to get down to tempting you. Do you mind if I do that? Instead, what does Scripture call the devil? An angel of light. Looks good. Looks holy. And here comes the first words, our spiritual words, words of faith. I have heard a number of stories, and I wonder if you have too, where someone has fallen into adultery with another Christian, and and when you hear the story, you find out that other Christian kind of led the other person into something they didn't think was right, but but they know what they're doing. They're a more mature Christian than I am. Horrible story many of you have heard. Ravi Zacharias, who I've benefited from, and he's now passed on, and, and his organization had accusations, and they had an independent look into his life and these accusations and and unfortunately a lot of truth there and part of it was when you have a man who speaks for God who's touring around the world for God and saying things like this is hard I'm under stress and I'm lonely well he's a man of God he knows what he's talking about It's not, and there you have it, the the evil. Beware, beware of the Christian leader. And let me say this to the women, particularly. Beware of that Christian man who finds some spiritual way to silence, do not commit adultery. If those words can be silenced in Scripture, you can silence anything. It's just Play-Doh. It's just super putty, uh, silly putty. You can make anything out of the Word of God. There's no way getting around that. Beware of that Christian leader. It's just such an amazingly tragic thing. 16 and 17, let's read. Look at the next thing she says. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Now, I kind of chuckle at that one. I threw cinnamon on my bed. Wow. (laughs) Things back then didn't smell as good as they do now. We have a lot of positive aromas. People take showers, indoor plumbing quite often. It's a little, and then as far as soft cloth, soft linen, we're used to that. This is setting the scene that back then was adding to the allure and the temptation. That's the second thing. And then one more thing. Let's hear her third thing she says. 18, come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. And that's what she said. And that took a lot to persuade this young man. Next verse, with much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. 
saying three things. One, I'm a person of faith too. I just came from church. Two, you got to see my bedroom. It's awesome. And then three, don't worry, my husband won't find out. And that taken together works. Here is the outcome, the end of the chapter. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many a victim she has laid low and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Seven or eight times what I just read has an allusion to death. Seven or eight times. The outcome for this young man is death. Starting at verse 22, ox goes to the slaughter. That's one. Stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver, a fatal wound. That's two. A bird rushes into a snare. Three. Will cost him his life. Four. Down to verse 26. For many a victim she has laid low. Probably a reference to death. Five. All her slain are a multi, multi, mighty throng. Six. Her house is the way to Sheol, the land of the dead. Seven. Going down to the chambers of death. Eight. I don't think that young man physically died there that night. This is one of the many places in Scripture when it refers to death. And sometimes I want to know, what, what, do you expect, what do you exactly mean by death here? And I wonder if it's a number of possible outcomes, if it's a number of different things, that in one sense, it's, it's the outcome will be that. Something's going to happen. Actually, there are things we know in Scripture about revenge deaths, by the way, revenge killings. It's a real thing. But, but also just death in another sense. Do you know how many men I've talked to, and women, but I'm thinking of the men here that I've talked with who had no idea how much they'd lose through adultery. They lost their wife, their house, their kids, sometimes their job, their in-laws. Many times they love their in-laws. And it's like death. I had no idea the price tag would be so high. Or maybe death in another sense. And this is what I want to I want you to hear some of that coming up here in his testimony in a moment. Is death in another sense that immediately he has to now what? He has to hide. Already he's hiding under the cover of night. Already he's hiding by not wanting, of course, the husband to know. And now this hiding will dominate his life. Even hiding from himself. And that involves a death of sorts. The father talks so much in Proverbs 1 through 9. It is amazing how much on this issue of adultery, of drinking water from a different well, milk from a different fridge, in other words, sleeping with someone who's not your spouse. And the the warning, I've seen things, son, this doesn't end well. Sometimes it's years off, and you can't see that when you're young. Maybe even the judgment after this life. You know, but it's there. I wonder what he would say, this father, in an age of pornography. Or you don't have to go just to that house over there. How much would he plead with his son here? In this age, it's so hard. It's so everywhere. It's so ubiquitous. It's the age we're living in, as many people have said, a pornified age. 
And then with that, I want, I want to, I'm going to start the video here in a moment, so go ahead and cue this up. I want you to hear from a man named Bob. An elder of a Christian church, of a reformed church, and has a secret. And he learned to hide it and try to square with that secret. And I want you to hear what he has to say. I got to a point in my Christian life where I felt like giving up. I just felt like, well, again, you're losing. You're losing this battle all the time. And I just thought, well, maybe I can do both. Maybe I can be an elder in my church and, and look at pornography too. You know, that might sound like a, a strange conclusion to come to as a Christian person, but the thing about it is, is that there was power in that lie because I was already doing it. I was already teaching Sunday school on Sunday morning and looking at pornography on Sunday night. It started impacting my marriage, uh, trying to move towards my wife, wasn't working. I didn't move towards her. Um, you know, she was married to an elder in the church who wasn't praying with her. I really felt that my marriage was going to end. I had come to a conclusion in my heart that I was going to get a divorce. It was going to be my fault. I was going to move in with my mother. And how was I going to get born in my mom's house? But two couples in our church moved towards us, and I just want to encourage you with this because it's because the body of Christ acted like the body of Christ. That's why I'm here today. That's why there's a difference in my life, because they saw that there was a problem in this marriage, and they moved towards us. I went to the uh, accountability group, and um, I confessed. And I said, there's something going on here that you need to know. And that is that I, I can't stop looking at pornography. That was the first time, that was around 18 years ago, and that was the first time those words ever came out of my mouth. I'll never forget uh, the first time I walked into Harvest, and I walked in the room, and I looked around the room, there was around 12 guys in the room, and I looked around and I made sure that I didn't know anybody. That was priority number one. <laughs> and uh, I kind of just sat there and started to weep but he did have me there and he did use the counselor and he did use harvest in powerful ways it became a lifeline for me it became something that i really needed to come to i was coming to counseling every week i was coming to harvest every week and um, i also developed a relationship with a fellow accountability per person that uh, so all three of those things became very real in my life and I believe God used all that so we can't get through this on our own we can't get through the Christian life on our own let alone victory over a life dominating sin it's just not going to happen God is doing something and he's did something towards me he moved towards me he came after me he brought those people, his body, to me. He brought counselors to me. He, bought, he put me in harvest so I could be in a room with a bunch of other Christian men who are struggling. So God is in all that. And you have to get your hope in him personally. It has to be about him, his love for you, his story for you, his gospel towards you, his pursuit of you. This is where you have to get your encouragement from. Because I, as soon as I start looking at myself, I get discouraged, okay? So you have to see God in it. And I can honestly tell you that if you are his child, he will come get you. And it's up to you whether you're going to fight that or not. If you saw that was Harvest USA, we are so blessed to have them in our backyard. Over in Dresher. If you think you're alone struggling with someone here, you are so wrong. This is something that many of us hide. 
And to have that breakthrough, right? That breakthrough testimony, all right? Did you hear that? It, it, it comes to the group at harvest. Wants to make sure no one knows him. Anonymity. And just sits down and starts crying. You know, forgiveness, hear me, brother and sister, forgiveness comes all at once. When you come to Christ, eternal life is given to you all at once when you come to Christ. Remember Jesus saying, out of nowhere, your sins are forgiven. Remember Jesus saying, out of nowhere, instantaneously, today you will be with me in paradise. Given in a heartbeat, that's God's greatest gift. As great as this is, sex, as great as creation is, the greatest thing is salvation. And it comes like that because God is eager to forgive all those who come to him in honesty, in faith, forgive like that. But you know what takes a while? What's not instantaneous is growth. Theologically, we say sanctification, becoming like Jesus. It takes time and there's fits and starts and you can get stuck. You can fall into sin. And your growth is constantly rooted in that forgiveness, in that eternal life, in being given status. As a child of God, my son, my son, my daughter, my daughter, all that's given to you from the very beginning. That's the foundation for growth, but we can still get stuck. Or worse. And we can still get very good at hiding. Please, if this is you, think about who can you enlist as a friend to talk about this with? Maybe call up Harvest. Maybe a, a pastor. Maybe a close friend. Because hiding is another way of saying death. It's an aspect of death that we just read about. And here's the good news. Our God is in the business of raising the dead. Of calling Adam and Eve out of hiding to restore them. Let us pray. Oh, Father, as we come to you now, We know we have unclean hands, unclean eyes. And some of us have been really hiding. Lord, we ask you to raise the dead. We ask you to call out those who are hiding. We ask you to use Harvest. Thank you for Harvest USA and Bob and Nicholas who was, was there and trained there for years and served there for years. And Dave White, we've been so well touched by this ministry and thankful for it. And we ask that we would avail ourselves of it. Or friends, trusted brothers and sisters, maybe, Lord, would you lead right now in the hearts and minds of those who need this, we pray. Be gracious to us. Show us your mercy by calling us out of hiding. Thank you for forgiveness, for eternal life, and thank you that we are your children. Thank you for Proverbs for children like us. Amen. Would you stand with us? Is there any forgiveness for the things I've done? 
Is there pardon for sinners? I know that I'm one before you. Before you. Would you take this heart of foulness and make it clean again? Would you pour on me your mercy as I confess my sin before you? Before you? Would you take this heart of foulness and make it clean again? Would you pour on me a mercy as I confess my sin before you? your Holy Spirit in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. I long to have a heart that's pure. Oh Lord, forgive me. I need your mercy. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word and to present her to herself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Let's sing together. The head that once, the head that once was crowned with glory, is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at His feet we.
Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Oh, your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. The fear, the fear that held us now is way to him who is our peace. His final breath upon the cross is now alive in me. Your name, your name. city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling of God is now with men. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. From the 
squalor of a borrowed stable by the spirit and the virgin's faith to the anguish and the shame of scandal came the savior of the human race but the skies were filled with the praise of heaven Suffering to save the lost. He fights for bread, he fights for me. Losing sinners from the claims of hell. And with a shout, our souls are free. Death defeated by Emmanuel. Now he's standing in. Beautiful music. Um, here, a benediction here. You are children of God. And not only does he give proverbs for children, but also benedictions. These good words that I'm so blessed as a minister to be able to say. What a privilege. In God's name to you all, please receive these in faith. He really wants to bless you. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Go in the Lord's strength. If you're on this side, will you please exit through these doors, on this side through those doors. And again, a special thank you to all of you online who've joined us. Blessings to you.